Uh, welcome to episode 10 of the OB broadcast. This is the first one of the new year, the first one I've ever recorded at 9.45 on a Wednesday evening with a bunch of people in the house. How's everyone doing? I'm excited to be in the new year. I'm having a good night. I uh, had a beer with dinner because we've got beers in the house. Uh, drink responsibly, but yeah, we don't always have alcohol, um, it, but since we had people over for for New Year's, we had a bunch of people over. We got some spares in the fridge, so it means I get to have a nice drink with dinner. Not that we just, ah, uh, you know, <laughs> why, why spend money on alcohol when you can spend it on woodworking tools? Because that's a thing that happens uh, more regularly than I'd like to admit. Uh, but yeah, New Year's, uh, we are in the New Year, but man, we had a New Year's Eve party, and it was... We had like 35 people over, and that's like 34 too many for me. Oh, and everything's falling apart around me. I think I'm finally starting to outgrow this little uh, this little tent that I've got going on in here. So New Year's was good. It, it turns out, like, I, I used to stay up, like, pretty consistently until 2 a.m., you know, just playing games, listening to music, you know, the thing that most teenagers and early 20s kids do. Uh... And now that I'm, I'm 22 and I've more consistently going to bed at like, you know, 11, waking up at 8.30ish, uh, it turns out I'm no good at staying up late because <laughs> on New Year's I didn't go to bed until like 3 o'clock and man, it just ruined me. I can't do it anymore. The other thing I can't do anymore is fix this sound booth in a way that I don't have a Snuggie falling on my head. Just can you, can you stop? Anyway, so New Year's was probably more enjoyable than I'd like to admit, but yeah, we, we got through it. We're in the new year. I've sent out emails to about three or four different people for interviews. I'm, I'm really trying hard to do uh, an interview every three to four weeks for the radio slash for here as part of my three-point plan to getting a job. I have high hopes for this year, as I'm sure I've mentioned. I don't know. I was talking to a couple of people, and it's, it's all mostly family. All mostly, that's redundant, but it's mostly family at these sorts of events, the New Year's. And, you know, a lot of them are asking because they all say, oh, you know, how's the, the radio stuff going? And th there's a few that I talk more explicitly about what's going on with, like, the podcast type stuff. And I, I, the thing that came up with all of them is, you know, uh, when we're talking, we talk about, like, oh, you know, the New Year, this and that, what are you doing for the New Year? People, and, and it's, like, a really common trend for you to say, oh, 2018 was awful, 2019 is going to be even worse. Yeah, yeah, it might if you live in, like, a third world country or, like, you know, something terrible happens to you. But for the most part, 2018 was only bad because you, I don't know, dropped your phone really early on in the year and you didn't get a boyfriend this year, right? It wasn't a terrible year. And I think if you go into 2019 saying it's going to be even worse, it is. And if you say, you know what, I'm really going to make 2019 pop for me, then it it just is. I'm not like a, a will it into existence sort of person, but I, I feel like if you go in with that mentality, that attitude, and that, you know, drive to actually make it good, it will be good, or at least it will be better than just, you know, awful. Uh, I've uh, got a few things on my notes. I'm not sure which I'm going to talk about, um, but just in, uh, in passing, I just got the last achievement on Isaac for the Switch. Uh, I mentioned that it is one of my favorite games to play on the Switch because I think it just really fits in well with the console. And yeah, I got the, the last achievement, which was uh, play, sorry, win 30 daily runs total. And it was one of those things where I knew I had to do them from the very start and I just didn't. And thus, it, uh, it took a long time to complete. But yeah, I, I finally finished the dailies, which means... I have 100 percented well, I've got all the achievements in that game for my profile. I'm just waiting for Nintendo to release the update for Booster Packs 4 and 5. I'm basically checking Reddit every day. The PS4 got it, like, on Christmas Day, and, and we're still without it. So hopefully, very soon, because I am looking forward to playing as the Forgotten. Yeah. If you're familiar with Isaac at all, he, he has a bone that you hit people with instead of tears to shoot, and uh, it's pretty cool. So yeah, I'm feeling good. I wanted to talk about gift baskets, and I didn't. I didn't talk about it over the the Christmassy episode because I think I recorded the Chris. Well, like the most recent one before Christmas, not after. 
this is how I know I'm like getting a lot older. I uh, I love gift baskets now. I, I was saying this to mum, but like when I when I was a kid, you know, like you know, stupid eight year old kid, you go, oh, oh, this isn't a Game Boy game. This is socks or like just stupid ungrateful kid. I, every kid goes through it, um, some more than others. But yeah, when when I was a kid, I don't think I really appreciated how good gift baskets were. It's like, oh, it's just a box full of food. But now, <laughs> now that I'm older and I enjoy food more and I am getting into cooking, gift baskets are awesome. So we got two, for example. One from like uh, the other side of, like my dad's side of the family and one, because uh, my mom works from home, so one of her patients brought it in. And it's just full of like different foods and you you know you can tell the quality depending on like the variety of what's in it. So the, the one that we got from our family, not only did it have like a bunch of dessert stuff, not necessarily for making desserts, although there was some of that, like actual dessert desserts. So there was a chocolate and cranberry pudding, and then like these sort of uh, hazelnut chocolate coated balls that are dusted in coffee. Right. So there's dessert stuff, and then there's also like a butterscotch brandy sauce, which is for desserts. And then there's like all sorts of, you know, really nice, small quantity, but high quality, like, you know, chips and crackers and dips. And, you know, there was some seafood sauce, which was awesome because we happen to have uh, a bunch of lobster or crayfish, depending on uh, which terminology you use. I didn't know that were the same thing, but it was it was really nice for that because uh, we happen to have a lot of it over the Christmas break. Turns out lobster's really good. I had no idea. And it's even better cold. But there's so much in these ones that we got. You know, there was some beef jerky, and there was like some rubs and spices. And not only that, there were some bars of soap. Obviously not edible, but <laughs> just a real variety, which is really cool. You know, we got another one that had similar sort of stuff, like, you know, pretzels and dips, and it had like a big bottle of champagne in the middle, which I don't think is standard for gift baskets. However, not complaining especially since it was like one less bottle of alcohol we had to buy when we had a million and a half people over. So if uh, if you're in my family, be prepared to get gift baskets next year because I'm I'm pretty convinced at this point in my life that gift baskets are, is, is the best present you could ever give. Because that's a thing. It's not just a... Uh, it's not specific to any one person. You can make an anything gift basket and it'll be awesome. My sister loved dogs. Bam, I can do a dog gift basket, a book about dogs, some, uh, I don't know, dog stencils, a stuffed dog, uh, a, an eraser, because she likes to draw the shape of a dog, dog treats for our dog, do, that, and that's for her, tailor-made, done. You know, my dad likes chili. It's so it's so easy, you could have like a nice big box, and you've got some fresh chilies, and you've got some chutneys and jams, and you've got some like uh, chicken wing marinades to go with whatever chili you've got. It's just so easy to put... To, and you know what? It's not limited to food. Because you could also do like a tech one. If your kid's like... Or, you know, or if anyone is sort of into technology. Or they're just like starter level. You know, you might have like a nice pair of quality headphones. And then one of those, you know, like a pack of five-in-one chargers for everything you need. And, you know, screen cloth... Uh, not screen cloths. What am I trying to say? The um screen wipes to you know, clean your phone screen or your, I was going to say DS, but I guess Switch is the is the more current one. You could put together a technology gift basket. That'd be so cool. So anyway, gift baskets might just be the greatest thing. Have a Pokemon one, too easy. You get a nice big Pokemon art book. Bam, that's one thing. A bunch of packets of Pokemon cards, maybe a DS game, depending on like the budget you're working with, some stickers. Uh, man, there's so much Pokemon merchandise. It'd be easy to put together one of those. Speaking of Pokemon, ah, oh, I didn't plan for such a good segue, but it's arrived and presented itself. So I've, uh, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned in the past that I'm trying to complete the Rayquaza collection. Basically, Rayquaza is my favorite Pokemon, and I'm trying to get one of each card printed with it. Oh, sorry, one of each card with it printed on it. And in my, from my counting on Bulbapy, there's roughly 60. And I'm about halfway there. I think in the past I said it was like 60% there or 66% there. Turns out there's a lot more than I thought. And I had uh, far fewer than I thought. I got a bunch of doubles, which is probably what helped inflate 
or rather what caused the number to inflate in my mind. But yeah, I, I recently, oh yes, I did mention this. I ordered uh, one from eBay, the Ultra Shiny GX Shiny Rayquaza, and that came and it's, you know, it's gorgeous. It's not as textured as some of the other ones, which might be a deterrent, although it's a card, so you're not going to touch it that much. I know, I really like the texture, so it seems, not lazy, but just like there's a little less there. Uh, but so that uh, arrived much quicker than the ones from Troll and Toad, which I ordered beforehand. I was really worried they weren't going to arrive or they were going to arrive in poor quality just because I'd read so many horror stories. Uh, they both arrived. They were both in top loaders, but only the rarer slash more expensive of the two was in its own sleeve in the top loader, we, uh, which was... I guess fine considering they were in like a, a bubble wrap pack and you know I, I looked at them and I put them in my own sleeves because I've got special Rayquaza sleeves because of course I do. <laughs> and so they came in there in good quality I was happy with. I don't know if I'm going to order from them again. From what I received I have no complaints and if I were to rate it it would just be like a you know four and a half out of five. Quality was very good. You know it was relatively cheap and the only real downside was like how long it took to arrive, but that's somewhat out of their control. But just reading so many horror stories, I, I feel like I might shop around. Apparently, uh, there's a website like TCG Player or, or or something similar to that. Apparently, they're very good if you can get around their whole shopping cart system because apparently, I had a bit of a look. It's a bit of a pain to try and find people that are selling all the cards you want and you're not paying like $3 million for shopping because it's coming from individual sellers not necessarily just one big warehouse but their their prices from what i've seen because i have had a bit of a look are pretty competitive and they, it's it's really hard because some of these rayquaza cards just are from 2005 and it's it's almost impossible to find them especially some of like the the really weird rare promo cards and you know occasionally i'll find one that's like you know cheap enough like you know 10 15 dollars for one that's in decent condition but, but some of these are really hard to find. Of course, there is going to be a, a day where I'm going to have to pick up the uh, the Gold Star Rayquaza, which is from... Oh, I don't even know the name of the set. It's like like roughly 2005. And boy, it's expensive. So I think I already used the joke, maybe Elon Musk will buy it for me. I don't know if I use that here or somewhere else. But yeah, so that's where the uh, Rayquaza collection is at. Really happy with it. They're all stored inside a Rayquaza branded box. I don't know if you can tell a, a pattern, if there's a pattern emerging, but yeah, I, I'm going to have to figure out some way to display them once the collection is complete. Although knowing Pokemon, they're just going to keep printing cards and keep printing variations of Rayquaza, so that's going to be great. It's going to be one of those... Basically, I haven't invested in a collection. I've invested in a financial chore because it won't ever be over. But we're going to get into uh, a bit more here, and you know, I'm real happy that... I'm more and more confident recording. Like, my sister's got a friend over, and it's, you know, it's 10 o'clock, so people are either awake watching stuff or getting ready for bed. And the fact that I'm not freaking out, like, are they listening to me behind the door? If I knock or open the door, will they be right there with their ear pressed up again? No, of course not. It's not that interesting. I mean, it's a very interesting podcast. You should listen to more episodes, but... So I'm working on it. It's all part of using 2019 to really... Set yourself up for the rest of your life, at least for me. And hey, if you're not doing that, maybe you, maybe you should. And and I feel like I've probably said similar things in the past, like in previous years. But the fact that now it's uh, it's archived on the internet, I, I really have to make sure that I'm doing it because otherwise, 2020 is going to come around and I'm going to look like an idiot. But I will be letting you know how the interview updates go. Because like I said, I've got three or four that are hopefully in the works for the next couple of weeks. And hey, now that I've got a nice radio set up here in my room, I don't have to go to the station to record them. It's a lot easier to get done. Uh, I wanted to quickly talk about Smash Bros. And I know I, I spoke about it like a, more of a, hey, this is why you should pick it up if this is what you're into. But I've been playing a bit more online. As it turns out, my internet is just good enough to only have just a little bit of lag when nobody is doing anything else on the internet and only after like 10 o'clock at night. And uh, it's fun. <laughs> there was a point where I was I was really trying to learn some different characters. And for whatever reason, I said, okay, one more game and I'm going to go back to Fox, who is my main. 
and I just destroyed this King K roll. Like it was so I would I haven't been that happy playing a game in a while. It just felt good. I was like, yes, the fox is back. So I've been uh, spending half my time playing fox and half my time learning new characters like Squirtle. But yeah, I, I was playing online, and this Incineroar was just destroying me. And I think this is what's so good about Smash Bros. as a game, because the way it went down was, I said to myself, well, actually, I said it out loud, which is, you know, I don't know if talking to yourself is any signs of um, you need help, but I said to myself out loud, you need to stop playing like garbage. Just think about what you're doing. And it was my own fault. I wasn't grabbing. I was shielding way too much. Uh, I was not punishing and I was playing predictably. I was rolling too much and I was doing the same thing over and over. Anyway, the point of the story is that eventually I beat this dude. I think he ended up having like more wins on me than I did him. But the last two games I won before he uh, he left. And it was good. And after that, I got back into the groove of playing Fox. But I think it's, a, it's good playing online versus, you know, playing against the CPU over and over again. Because in situations like that, you can go, oh, well, hey, I'm self-aware that I was playing badly, and now I can take these steps actively to get better, or rather convince myself to stop playing badly and play better the way you know you can. Inversely, if you can't play better and you're just getting destroyed constantly, you can use that as like a learning tool, you know, provided it's not someone just pressing buttons, it's actually someone good enough, you can go, oh, okay, well, this is how they are beating me, and this is why, and this is what they're doing. Maybe I can learn from it. The uh, The thing that I was um, I was particularly happy about is the fact, and, and this is, like, not me bragging, but this is just me, like, saying, oh, yes, I'm an adult now, because a couple of times I came up against someone that was very clearly a child, just, just very clearly, had only just picked up the game, had no idea what they were doing, and you know what? I played the first game, and then I didn't rematch them. And there definitely would be a time in my life where I would have sat in that lobby and just mindlessly clicked buttons, beating this child or, you know, person not good at the game, senseless, racking up wins for for no real game. And, and so I was really happy that I was able to say, you know what, you're old enough that you can go find someone else to play. The other thing that uh, came to my attention is that there are certain people, because I, I played a lot of Pokemon trainers, like, versed them, and as it turns out, like, 80% of them just wanted to stick to one specific character, uh, a, a fairly even split of all three, really, but the, the thing that I determined is that if you're playing online and someone clearly just wants to play Squirtle, for whatever reason, in this, uh, well, I guess it's just the way it works, but if you are playing as Squirtle and you die, your next stock you're going to start as Ivysaur. Oh, sorry. Yes, it is Ivysaur. And then the next stock you're going to start as Charizard. If they clearly just want to play the one character, just give them time to swap. Because the amount of... T- like, it, it takes a while to, you know, use your downbeat. Like, if just to cycle through two characters. So, I mean, look. Hey, if you were really eager for those wins, you would go and grab him when he's Ivysaur and just, you know, put 30% into him while he's trying to downbeat a change. And it's not like preaching, like, oh, play honorably on, like, an online fighting game. But, dude, if a guy wants to play Squirtle, just give him, like, 30 seconds. It's not like he's getting free damage on you. Just let him change. Anyways, I have been enjoying Smash Bros. Uh, it's it's weird. I haven't played an online game in the longest time. And I think m- most of that's not, to, like, due to having bad internet. But, yeah, you know, the games are... The internet connection is just good enough that I'm able to shield and tech and grab reliably Uh, maybe not stuff that's like frame specific like very frame dependent but you know it's it's playable which is a real real change of pace for our internet because it is we get two mbps download speed which is horrendous the main thing that i wanted to get into was 12 rules for life the book that i've been listening to for whatever reason, though, I've decided that I'm just going to keep teasing it and pushing it to the end, because I wanted to talk about a Reddit, um, a, a subreddit that I've been looking at basically for the past 24 hours, and I'm convinced it's the worst thing in the world. Side note, this isn't to disparage any of the people that post on this subreddit or enjoy browsing it, because there's nothing wrong with those people, 
But for whatever, well, not for whatever reason, for a very obvious reason, it makes me livid. It's called r slash choosing beggars, and I'm sure if you are familiar with Reddit in any way, you are familiar with the subreddit. But basically, it's <laughs> it's just a bunch of screenshots and captions and anecdotes of people that are being choosing beggars, which is, you know, oh, you know the phrase beggars can't be choosers? Yeah, you know, people that are both, that are wanting free stuff and then also demanding certain quality and that you deliver to them. It's funny for about two minutes and then you just read more and more and maybe this is just a me thing but you get so angry reading constant stories of someone saying hey hi uh do you still have this available yes the the price is fifty dollars firm will you do twenty dollars no that'd be working too much at a deficit on my end sorry i can do 45 but 50 is really where i'd like to sell it and then the other person goes i just a string of incoherent expletives, right? And that's 90% of them. And I get why it's interesting to read. You know, you look at people, you have a bit of a laugh that, oh, you know, they're being somewhat publicly shamed, although, you know, not completely publicly because they're they're always censored their names and their pictures and stuff. But ah, look at this person being stupid because they're swearing at someone for, you know, wanting... And the other common example is in a, a Facebook buy, sell, or swap page. It's like, hi, I would like this, this, and this, and I would like it for free, and I would like you to deliver it to this area. It's just abysmal. And for, for someone that's played a game like Warframe, where there is like a trade element to it, you get somewhat used to it. Like back when I used to play, um, <laughs> I say it so proudly, like I've kicked the habit of smoking or alcoholism or something. And I mean, it's... You know what? I'm not going to say it's close, but it's almost close to being close. But basically, back back when I was still a victim of Warframe, not not that it's a bad game, it's just it really gets you, really gets its hooks in, and it doesn't want to let go. But you, there's a, there's an element of oh, you know, I will pay this much in-game currency for this item, and the thing that's different about this game is that you can earn in-game currency through trading with other people, so you can actually play the whole game and get all the exclusive stuff without putting any money in you just gotta you know grind a little bit and be smart about your trading but there is a certain level of oh can you give me 10 platinum for free i'm a girl slash i'm new slash my account got hacked slash i got scammed all of which are like not true but you 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 somewhat get used to it you know i I dealt with uh, a lot of people saying hey can you just you know give me this for free or, hey, can you give this to me for free because I'm a girl? Or can you give this to me for free because I'm new? And, like, if, if someone is actually new and you have something that is worthless to you and worth something to them, you should give it to them because, you know, why not? But it's very different when you can see clearly that they are not new to the game. They have ample stuff and they have ample money to buy it with. I actually got in this, like, really long exchange with this kid... And I say kid because it was a kid who was like, you know, begging for free stuff. I can't remember if he was just saying, give it to me for free or give it to me because I'm a girl or something. But basically it was a really long back and forth where he just got super angry and said that I, he had Nikes and all I could afford was sketches and that I was so broke is <laughs> the dumbest thing ever. But it was saying, oh, I, I was so broke that I was playing with my PlayStation in a cardboard box connected to someone else's internet or power. It made no sense, but it was clearly like a, you know, a, a teenager or a preteen or like a prepubescent kid trying to insult me. Apart from the fact, like, I just don't, how do you not clue on that you're begging for free stuff? So insulting someone's financial status isn't, it doesn't work. <laughs> but anyway, the point is this uh, Choosing Vegas subreddit, it just got me upset for an entire day because as I was waking up, I saw, I can't remember how I got onto it. It must've been a recommendation or, or, or something, but I read one and I went, oh, this is pretty funny. And I sat in bed for like probably 45 minutes, just reading one after the other. And like I said, the first two were funny. It's like, ha, oh, look, look at these people just demanding you do stuff. There was one It's like, oh, you, you have to I'm renting my place out, but you have to look after my cat and my house. 
which is obviously not renting or paying someone to house and cats it, but the first few were funny. And then I just got proceedingly more and more angry at like the fact that this ha- not the fact that it happens because I get it. You know, sometimes it eats people in bad situations and sometimes it's just poorly raised people, but just the frequency of it, just depressing. So I think I got my entire life's fill of that subreddit and I won't be going back. Moving on to the main thing that I really wanted to talk about is 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote for Chaos by Jordan B. Peterson. So it's an audiobook that I picked up, or rather listened to through the uh, library service that we have here in Australia. It's called Overdrive. Basically, if you have a library card, which is free to get, you can use their online library service, which is oh, audiobooks and ebooks, you and I think podcasts, I'm not sure you can uh, loan them the same way you would a library book. The thing that confuses me, and I think I mentioned this uh, in the last episode, but there's still a level of, oh, you have to loan, uh, hold it and then loan it, and then you can only have it for a certain amount of time, which I didn't think really worked with digital copies. Like, surely you can just give it out to everyone. I mean, I, I was waiting two months to listen to this book. I mean, it was sort of just sat in the background waiting um, but I maybe it's like a licensing thing. You can only have three copies and only three people can have those copies at any given time. I'm not sure why they do it. Maybe it's to try and emulate a library because they're still, you know, somewhat working with this antiquated platform of loaning books at a time and they don't realize that everything is online at any point. But hey, I get to utilize a government service that is paid for by taxes and, you know, listen to free audiobooks. So, hey, can't be all bad. But yeah, I I was listening to, I'm still in the process, I'm in chapter 10 of 12, but I just wanted to talk about what I've been feeling about the book thus far. And again, I know Jordan B. Peterson has like a certain reputation online, people feel very strongly on either side about him, they either think, you know, he's the best, smartest, most amazing person in the world. Or they think, oh, <laughs> you listen to one Jordan B. Peterson thing and now you think this way because of this. Right? It's it, He's very polarizing online. People have very strong opinions about him. However, I just wanted to listen to the, the psychology audiobook. And you know what? It's actually, it's actually a really good listen. So the Cliff Notes version of the origin of the book is that Jordan B. Peterson is a uh, clinical psychologist and psychology professor over in Canada. And there's a website, Quora, Q-U-O-R-A, which is similar to Yahoo Answers, where people will sort of crowdsource answers to questions. And I think in the prologue, yes, the beginning part, uh, he was saying that, you know, he had a habit of just going and wasting time, not wasting time, but like um, procrastinating what he was doing by answering questions on Quora. And someone said something to the effect of, oh, you know, what are some guidelines that I should implement to have a successful life? And he listed 40, and then it got a, a lot of recognition and upvotes and or whatever they use on Quora. Quora Platinum. <laughs> so dumb. Uh, but yeah, he decided to distill those 40 ideas into 12 and turn it into a book. And it's, it's interesting because it's kind of described as like a self-help book, but I didn't really find it as such. There's obviously, you know, levels of that in there. But for me, it's more of just been like a, an entry level into learning a bit more about psychology. And I think I was saying in the previous podcast, I've been wanting to do, you know, more reading, more slightly intellectual reading, because I feel like I feel like I used to read a lot and engage with this sort of, you know, content a lot more. And it's just slipped, really, as a result of video games, to be completely honest. So I'm just trying to get back into that a little bit. Part of that through listening to, you know, psychology books and, you know, whatever else. I can uh, I can find. So there's uh, there's 12 chapters, obviously, because there's 12 different rules, and each chapter sort of is a blend of personal anecdotes of him living his life slash learning psychology as a student. And then there's also a combination of, like, actual uh, psychology lessons that you could apply, and then also some anecdotes of... Well, not anecdotes, but, um, I guess, cliff notes of interactions that he's had with actual patients and there's also some uh, literary and, and biblical references in there 
it's a, a really interesting way to break up, not break up, but uh, compose a psychology book. And I know I found it very interesting. It's one of those books that you, it's hard to find, but it's accessible enough to the lay person like you or I. Uh, and that's quite presumptuous, but it's it's accessible enough to the average person that you can pick it up and you might not understand all of it and you might actually pay attention to what it's saying, but you can get something from it. But it's also advanced enough that, uh, you know, someone that's actively engaged in the psychology community or well, psychology field would be able to take a lot from it and understand and not be sitting there as if they're being, you know, read their ABCs in 12th grade. So the the 12 rules are stand up straight with your shoulders back, treat yourself like someone you are responsible for helping, make friends with people who want the best for you, compare yourself to who you were yesterday, not to someone else today, don't let your children do anything that makes you dislike them, set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world, pursue what is meaningful, not what is expedient, tell the truth or at least don't lie, assume that the person you are listening to might know something that you don't, be precise in your speech. Do not bother the ch- the children when they are skateboarding and pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. Obviously, those are 12 semi-specific things. But the interesting thing about it is that there's more to each of them. Like, if you go to the rule that says... Where are you? Set your house in perfect order before you criticize the world. Right? You listen to that and you go, oh, well, it's about you know, self-reflection and, you know, the way you carry and treat yourself and the way you should have yourself organized in your own life before you criticize other people. And it's just interesting to listen to, have it, it's interesting to listen to and have it be, you know, there is some level of, hey, actually make sure your physical house is in order, you know, make sure it's, you're clean because, you know, this is where you live, this is how you treat yourself, this is how you you know, wake up each day and go to sleep. And that says a lot about you and will dictate a lot of how things go for you. And then there's obviously levels of, you know, uh, what what it's mostly getting at, which is, you know, make sure your, your life is in order before you criticize other people. But the, the one I think I took the most from is stand up straight with your shoulders back. And it's so interesting because it starts off talking about, you know, posture and ergonomics. And then it goes into lobsters. You know, he talks a lot about lobsters and the way that they live and engage with one another. And, you know, basically their body language and their posture says a lot about, you know, how tough and fierce they are. And so it, so if there's two lobsters fighting for territory, the one that has the more demanding presence is going to win over one that has sort of like meek, shallow body language. Like there's there's not even a contest. Obviously, if they're both even, which, you know, sometimes there are, there's like five levels and it escalates to like full-on lobster murder. And, you know, it's interesting to hear him talk about that and then relate it to, I can't remember if it was a patient he had or someone that he was aware of or a hypothetical that he made up. Uh, But it it was basically something to the effect of a woman that was anxious or depressed or, or something similar who went out to the mall and then had a bad time, something happened, had a panic attack, ran away, and then the next time they went to the mall, couldn't actually make it, you know, they just hyperventilated or they convinced themselves they couldn't do it, so they stopped going to the mall, and then from there it's a progressive, oh well, now I can't even go near the mall, and then the service station, and then the corner shop, and then you can't leave your house, and it's interesting the way he, you know, connects posture to self-confidence to lobsters. Again, I don't necessarily feel like I needed a, a self-help book in, in any capacity, but it's just interesting to not only read and listen to and compare to the way you live, uh, but also see if you can actually, you know, learn something to help you interact with other people. Like, for example, uh, which one is it? Uh, I think it is assume that the person you are listening to might know something you don't. Uh, and that's something that, you know, m- my parents in particular have, you know, instilled into me from a young age. So that that wasn't so much about learning, but it's just the way he took that topic and then, you know, spoke about different ways of talking to people and interacting with people, you know, because it's more than just listening to what they're saying. It's how you engage, you know, your body language, what you say, how you say it, how much you say, how much you don't say, what you say with your eyes and 
you know, what you say with your responses. And he, you know, gave examples. He was talking about a, I can't remember if it was a convicted felon or if it was someone seeking psychiatric help from him. Uh, but just the, or it might've been like a training pro, uh, process when he was becoming a psychologist, but just a very dark situation. Uh, I won't go into it too much in case you're interested in listening to it yourself, but uh, just the way he described what he had to do and say and not do and not say to get through the interaction both efficiently and safely for both him and the integrity of the of the interaction between him and that person. It's really, really interesting to listen to. It was it was nice. Um <laughs> listening to chapter three, which is make friends with people who want the best for you. It it was actually really sweet because, you know, I went to high school at an all boy school. And so generally speaking, a lot of the friendships you make and, and this is a total generalization. But I feel like the friendships you make at an all-boys school are kind of stronger just because there's there's a whole level of vying for female attention removed. Um, but I didn't really keep in contact with anyone from high school. I mean, I had a, a couple of close friends for uh, you know through high school and then even out of high school for a bit. But none of them really you know stood the test of time. And so right now I've, I've got a, a pretty small circle of like friends but listening to this chapter it was just so reminiscent of of one of my friends Anne. and basically whenever i do anything right whenever i cook something whenever i do some woodwork and i build something you know whenever i you know come back from a a training session and we just chat about it right she's always almost overwhelmingly supportive uh supportive almost overwhelmingly supportive and positive and it was really nice to know that even though there was 160 guys in my, you know, year 12 graduating class that I was, you know, friends, well, I was close enough with any of them that I could have had a conversation. It's nice to know that even though none of those stick around, you know, you still have a couple of friends that are that overly, uh, overtly supportive and, you know, proud of you. It was, it was just nice to hear that, you know, reinforced and confirmed in a, in a psychology book. Because listening to this, the entire chapter, I was like, oh, this is just Anne all over. I'm still not 100% finished, like I mentioned. I got two chapters left. I do not bother the children when they are skateboarding and pet a cat when you encounter one in the street. I'm actually really interested to get into them. Uh, I don't really know. Like, you have ideas. Like, you read the titles. You, you listen to the first one, stand up straight with your shoulders back, and you go, oh, this is about, like, posture, the way you carry yourself. And then he goes into it, and then you start to understand the way that he writes and he speaks, and you go, oh, okay, so it's more to it than just the title. Uh, but even having listened to most of the book, <laughs> I still don't know what I'm in for with these last two chapters. But, it, yeah, it's, uh, it's on Audible. If you Google 12 Rules for Life and Antidote for Chaos, the first thing that pops up is Audible. But yeah, most bookstores, I imagine, would have it. Physical ones, uh, online libraries, both that are government funded and like just library libraries that are online. I imagine you can find it anywhere. I'd recommend it. And again, I know I know Jordan B. Peterson has like, and it's it's. I don't think it's because of the content that he has. I think it's the fact that it's it was for a while and and still continues to be very widely known online you know there's a a bunch i think i've seen maybe one or two like videos of you know him engaging with people in public you know in uh, in debate scenarios actually there was one where he he was doing an interview clearly for like a a book or for something a tour maybe and this real smug interviewer was like who's your favorite author and then he says his favorite author and then she says who's your favorite female author and then they've it's been edited edited in such a way that it makes it look like he can't think of one and i I can't tell because again it's just it's it's online media so it's all highly edited i couldn't tell if he had an answer that they edited out to make it seem like he was sexist or like couldn't think of one or maybe he just you know didn't say anything because he wasn't showing the interviewer the respect that he showed them but it was just I think that is, you know, 
partly the reason he has the, the reputation that he has because he's engaged a lot with you know debates on, on both sides really it's weird because every time you, you see people online that are really left-leaning they say that jordan b peterson is like right-leaning and then you see people that are right-leaning look at him and they go oh he's just like a liberal dude He's really so I can't I can't actually place him and I, I don't really know enough about the the two sides to actually comment too much. I just know that like one is is more like safe space and less racist. But yeah, I, I think it is a a really good book. If if you are like somewhat literary, you read some books and you're wanting to learn a bit more about psychology, I think it's a it's a good stepping stone because like I said, it's not so advanced technically and you know regard uh, in terms of the terminology that is going to be too advanced for you to pick up you know you, you can get a lot out of it and like i said with one of those chapters it had a lot to say on how to talk to people and how to interact with them even if you know you're perfectly fine talking you know it just and they're tips really don't I, I know it's targeted as like rules for life a self-help book but don't well, at least for me, the way I've read it is, or listened to it, it's not a self-help book where I'm trying to change the way I live. It's more like, you know, tips and... Tr it's like real life hacks. You know, the life hacks are just like, oh, put 50 cigarettes in the end of a balloon and then light them or, or whatever. Fake. Man, life hacks are so bad online. But basically, that's what it is. Like, you know, this is how to carry yourself a little bit better. This is how to garner a little more respect when you talk. This is how to show a little more respect when you're listening. This is how to, you know, think about raising kids when you have them. I think there's a lot of good in there. And I think if you put aside the preconceived notions of the author that you may or may not have, you might actually enjoy it. And even if you don't, it might be a gateway into more books, more audiobooks, or, or more psychology as a whole. I think I'm going to call it here. I know it's a little on the shorter side, but it's uh, it's nearly 11 o'clock at night, so I really shouldn't be yelling in my room about audiobooks and Smash Bros. Uh, but I, I do want to keep a certain amount of content in each. So if I can hit, you know, 45 minutes-ish in each of them, some a bit longer, hopefully none any shorter than that, uh, I'll be happy. Thank you for listening. This was episode one of 2019, the first of 52. I'm, I'm really adamant to have one a week at the very least. And I'll be back next week uh, definitely with a, well, I say definitely, hopefully definitely, <laughs> with a conf confirmation on an interview and a bit about them. So thank you for listening. Uh, be sure to leave a comment because engagement helps a channel grow. And uh, don't text and drive. Yeah.